John chapter 6. Well, believe it or not, our attendance is up today. In fact, uh, if, if you would look at what it was last week to what it is this week, we probably are the fastest growing church percentage in the county. You gotta look at the positive, right? You always look at the positive. You know the drill, right? Once you find John chapter six, go ahead and stand with me as we do honor to the reading of God's word. Thank you for being here this morning. It's cold. You say, boy, you're you're observant. Looking over here at Bob, I thought he was motioning at me to put his mask on. John chapter 6. The title of the message today is Leaving Jesus. Now, the text that you see up there is beginning with verse 22, but we're not, we're not going to start that far back. We're going to start with verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was from before. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Now I pause for a moment to point out that in verse 60, it says, therefore, many of his disciples, disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. And then Jesus says to them in verse 64, but some of you do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe, and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by the Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Will you also go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Bless the Lord, I pray, the reading of your word. May it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I thank you, Lord, for those who have come today, despite the weather, despite other issues. And we have gathered here today, Lord, in your house to worship you. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us in all that we would do. Grant me the words, Father, the words of life that would encourage your children who may be discouraged. But also, Lord, that might light the way to eternal life to those who have never accepted Christ as their Savior. We pray that all that we do here today, Father, brings glory to you. We pray that your will will be done and your word will be magnified. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, thank you, you may be seated. 
Before I get into the message, lest I forget later, and because I also want to mention this online, please pray for Carol Flynn. Carol took a fall this past week, broke two ribs. Uh, her family has been ministered to her, and we are thankful for that, but please pray for Carol. Also, please pray for Bob Hartman. Tomorrow he will have surgery at St. Barnabas to repair a, a, a valve in his heart. We are hoping that uh, this will give him some relief from some of the heart issues that he has had recently. And I would also request that you continue to pray for Phyllis. Uh, she has uh, made some improvement. Uh, she still wears out very easily. We have not yet heard from any of the results of the MRI that she had on Thursday, but we do appreciate your prayers for her. I think it is important. In fact, I think probably it is more important right now than ever because of what we've experienced the past two years of this pandemic that keeps us apart so often that we never cease to pray for one another. I think it's very important that we never forget the importance, not only the importance, but the power of prayer. And so we need to always remember to pray for one another. Excuse me. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. This is an amazing statement. Think about it. We have our calendars, we have our plans, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And yet here we find that the wisest man who ever lived says this, Do not boast of tomorrow. You do not know what the next 24 hours will bring into your life. Who can predict it? If George Gallup had existed in the day of Jesus, if he had taken a poll of his audience on one day, the day before we are reading about now, when Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, his approval rating would have gone through the roof. But within the next 24 hours, when Jesus declares himself to be the bread of life, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no part in me. His approval rating would have tanked. Gallup would have said he went from a hero to a zero in less than 24 hours. Maybe this should teach us that you never count your future upon public opinion. One day you can be the hero, the next day you can be the goat. I would be remiss if I did not mention that the Cincinnati Bengals knocked off the number one seed Tennessee Titans last night. Cincinnati boy. Now with that dispensed, let's move on. In verse 15 of John chapter 6, it says, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to a mountain himself alone. Now, now what had happened? Again, let me remind you that he had fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. I'm not sure how many of that crowd really knew where that feast came from. But they did know one thing. They knew that for some of them, for the first time in their lives, they knew what it was to have a full belly. In America, eating is a recreational sport. There are more commercials on television about eating than any other subject. One moment, you are encouraged to eat a sandwich that will put 4,000 calories into your body. The next moment, 
you are encouraged to buy the magic food of Jenny Craig. So the 4,000 calorie sandwich will not make you obese. We think about food all the time. Usually, we are planning the next meal as we are finishing the last meal. That is not the way it is in the rest of the world. Much of the world today will experience the same thing the people of Jesus experienced. That food came as a premium. And you never knew where your next meal was going to come from. In America, Christians leave church and fight over where they're going to spend or where they're going to eat lunch. Most of the world wonders if it will have lunch. That was the condition of these people. No wonder when this prophet of Nazareth not only spoke words like no one had ever spoken before, but filled their bellies as they had never experienced it before. No wonder they thought to themselves, this is the guy who ought to lead us. We'll make him king. And when Jesus perceived that this was what they were going to do, remember, this world was not Jesus' kingdom, at least when he came the first time. That's what he told Pilate. My kingdom is not of this world. He came for a grander design than to rid Palestine of the Romans and to reestablish the kingdom of Israel. That's what many hoped for, but that's not why he came. He came to establish a spiritual kingdom. The Apostle Paul says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That was his purpose the first time. To redeem us from our sin. Everything that Jesus did, even the miracle of the loaves of fishes, were for the purpose to validate who he was. The living Son of God who came for greater purpose. Now, go with me for just a moment. Here they are. One day, this crowd, this multitude, is fed with five loaves and two fish. For the first time in their life, they know what it is to eat more than they need. They awake the next morning remembering the experience from the day before and they find that Jesus has left. And so they follow him to the other side. And when they find him, they say, Master, what are you doing here? But Jesus knew exactly why they saw him. Again in verse 26, you seek me not because you saw the miracle, but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. Now again, in their defense, it is a lot more pleasant to be satisfied, to have your hunger satisfied, than to go hungry. I read an article not long ago that said, and this is an amazing statement, that one out of every seven children in New Jersey will go to bed hungry tonight. Isn't that sad? In a country that has so much abundance? Isn't it sad that what we throw away could probably feed a lot of hungry people. Hunger drives people. That's what happened that day. Jesus said, you seek me not because you saw the miracle, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Luke chapter 4, verse 4. I think Jesus addresses that issue here where he says, 
that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. One of the reasons we live in a world of such abundance and this world is so unsatisfied is because material blessings can only satisfy for so long. Material blessings can only make up for so much of the emptiness that we experience by not having a relationship with God. Someone said that there is a hole in our soul that only God can fill. Many people try to fill it with the things of the world. Some try to fill it with drugs or pleasure or possessions or power or popularity. But none of those things give lasting satisfaction. Someone wrote back in the 60s, the 1960s, I realize for some of you that was prehistoric, that only Jesus can satisfy your soul. And I believe that that is absolutely true. The miracle of the loaves and fishes caused a ground swell in his popularity. But it was not their souls and not his popularity that concerned Jesus. Let me walk through some of the scripture in John 6. Verse 27, Jesus says, Labor not for the meat that perishes, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Don't work for the things that aren't going to last. John wrote, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Those who love the world do not love the Father. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father but of the world. And then he says, and the world passes away and the desires of it. But he who does the will of the Father endures forever. You know, if you really look at the message of Jesus, it's always consistent. Don't labor for the things that aren't going to last. Labor for the things that that will make a difference in your eternity. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon this earth. Thieves steal it, rust corrupts it, moths will eat it. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He was talking about the superiority of the spiritual life over the material world. Verses 33 through 35. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said he unto them, Lord, and then they then said they unto him, Lord, forevermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh unto me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. They are not on the same page. Jesus is speaking of spiritual satisfaction. They're still looking for another meal. The bread that brings satisfaction is the one who has come down from heaven. He's speaking of himself. And they said, Lord, forevermore give us this bread so we won't be hungry anymore. Jesus speaks of the spiritual. They think of the material. Verses 47 through 49. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers that eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Now Jesus gives the solution to a problem of the ages. What was the manna all about? It was an object lesson. God provided bread from heaven 
so Israel could feast in the wilderness. Remember the quality of the manna? You had to gather it every day, remember? Somebody decided, I'm going to sleep in tomorrow. I think I'm going to gather enough for two days. And the first day he had a great meal. And the second day he had worms. Or the manna became worms. Do you understand that even then, God was giving them an object lesson? Remember when Jesus taught the disciples to pray? Give us this day our daily bread. Do you know what affluence has done for us? It has made us so self-dependent that we no longer think we have to depend upon God. And so God is no longer important to so many. Verse 51. Jesus makes the point. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Could he say that more clearly? I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eats this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Let me go quickly to verses 53 and 54. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And they took it literally. At that moment in time, it clicked in their mind that he is endorsing cannibalism. Remember the Last Supper? When Jesus said, this is my flesh which is broken for you he didn't rip off a piece of his flesh he broke bread it was an object lesson this is my flesh which is broken for you this cup is the new testament in my blood drink you all of it and because of a misunderstanding in the early days of the church the roman empire used the idea that the church was endorsing cannibalism as one reason to persecute them. Jesus was not saying, you have to literally eat me. He was saying, and giving this lesson, that if you are going to have a relationship with my Father, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. If you are going to have a relationship with me. What is, what is the main characteristic about food? When you eat it, it becomes a part of you. Jesus is saying, you have to have a real relationship with me. You have to take into yourself the Son of Man. Understand, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. It's the reason I came. Don't get distracted by the loaves and the fish. Don't get distracted by, by the material. All this passes away. But your soul is eternal. And you need to make eternal preparation for your soul. And the only way you can have the life that he came to give is to make him a part of you. By faith accepting him as your personal savior. John chapter 6 verse 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. But he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. The manna they eat they die. Jesus you partake of him. You live. Many of his followers were shocked. These things are hard to listen to. Who can understand this? Jesus turned to them and said, Does this offend you? Some of you, here's why it offends you, because some of you have never believed. Will you believe me now? 
The words I speak to you from the Spirit, they bring life. There is no other way. Trust and truth and popularity were what mattered to them. But only truth can save us. What matters or what follows is one of the saddest scenes in the New Testament. I want you to see it. The day before, he's fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. They've gone to the other side. He's been pursued. They want another meal. Jesus is trying to give them something that is even greater. Jesus is trying to open their eyes so that they can see who he is, so they can know who he is, and so they can forever be with him in heaven by accepting who he is. But instead, they hear a literal message when Jesus is giving an object lesson. And they're offended. And they are ready to leave. I want you to imagine this. In verse 66 it says, From that time, many of his disciples. There's a key there. It doesn't say many of his followers. It doesn't say many of his acquaintances. Many of his disciples. What is a disciple? By definition, a disciple is a learner and a follower. Many of these have been with him before. Many of these people have been following his ministry. But now, maybe they were drawn by the miracles. I mean, that would have gotten my attention, wouldn't it have gotten your attention? Turning water into wine, making blind men see. That would have gotten my attention. I think I would have wanted to know more about that. I mean, that'd been a great bandwagon to get on, don't you think? Hello. But then he lays down the groundwork. It's not a casual relationship. If you want to have eternal life, you have to trust me completely. So here he stands. Multitudes have come out to see him. He gives a hard lesson. You have to eat of my flesh, you have to drink of my blood, or you have no part of me. And many of his so-called disciples turned and walked no more with him. And Jesus turns to the twelve. And he says, Will you also Go away. I have two points for you this morning. Number one, those who left. What would it be like if everyone who ever walked the aisles of this church who are still alive in this, in this area if everyone who called on the name of Christ, if everyone still attended this church, well, we'd have been in a building program long ago. We would have had, to, had a much bigger auditorium or at least had multiple services. But I guarantee you there are people in this area that at one time at least got involved with the crowd who now walk no more with Jesus. Where have they gone? What are they doing? Well, you know, I understand that sometimes there's problems in a church and sometimes there's reasons to leave a church and maybe some just went to another church. But I guarantee you there are many. Not only did they no longer fellowship with First Baptist Church of Dover or with Faith Family Fellowship, 
that they no longer walk with Jesus. Verse 64 says, but there are some of you that believe not. Where did they go? Well, let me give you a few examples. Some chose the world. Remember Demas? Demas is probably the greatest example of a spiritual deserter in the New Testament. For Demas hath forsaken me, Paul said, just, just hours before his execution. He draws to mind Demas. Well, why? Is that the only thing we ever learned about Demas? No. Earlier in the ministry, Demas was a worker, a faithful worker, a fellow servant, Paul called him. The second time he's mentioned in Scripture, it's an afterthought. Well, Demas is hanging out with us. And then Demas was gone. Things got hard. Road got tough. Demas remembered the old life. And Demas hath forsaken me because he loved the things of the world more. I guarantee you, listen, being a Christian, I mean a real Christian, being a real Christian, not a nominal Christian, not a generic Christian, I'm talking about a born again, changed life, experienced Christian. In this world, that takes some effort. And it is easier not to be a Christian than it is to be a Christian. Now I realize there are some of these feel-good churches. Christianity is fun and all that sort of thing. And the only problem I have with that, listen, I have fun as a Christian. I'm a fun guy. I have fun as a Christian. But my Christianity is not fun. My Christianity is work. I'd rather be sitting on a beach with a Coke and a moon pie than in North Jersey on a cold day doing what we do. That's my flesh. Sometimes our flesh tells us, by the way, there are some folks today, and I understand, some aren't here because they're sick, some aren't here because they're cold, but some aren't here because they're attending the church of the inner spring mattress. They have chosen comfort over work. Demas chose the world. Number two, some chose to worship the creation rather than the creator. And there is no doubt that some of these people had been idolaters before meeting Jesus. When it got too hard to be a believer, they returned to the old life. It's easy to get captivated by nature. Psalm chapter 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Nature reveals the the power of God. Would you agree to that? I mean, nature is miraculous. You know, look at a sunrise sometimes. Watch a sunset. If you're not a morning person, watch a sunset. You know, visit Niagara Falls. Hear that gush of that powerful water. Walk out in the middle of the storm and hear the thunder and watch the lightning. Nature is amazing. It shows the power of God. But it does not show us his heart. That is for Jesus to do. Remember that Philip said, show us the Father and it's sufficient. And Jesus said, here it is. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We live today in a world of nature worshipers. They would rather take care of nature than take care of human beings. And by the way, God gave man the stewardship of nature, and we've not done a very good job, but human beings are more important than nature. Somebody will tell me that's hate speech somewhere along the line. God loves people more than anything. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. If you want to see God, don't look at nature. Look at Jesus. Number three, some chose atheism. Psalm 14, 1. 
The fool said in his heart, there is no God. Atheism is the product of despair. I have never known a happy atheist. Not really. I have never met a pleasant one. Dr. Julian Huxley, past president of UNESCO, wrote, Science and logic have brought the world to the stage where God is no longer a useful hypothesis. Well, Mr. Huxley, when they tell you your family, someone you love has cancer, you see how science can comfort you. Or when they tell you you're dying, and you better get ready, see how science helps you along the way. I saw a commercial, some of you have seen it, the son of our former president, Ronald Reagan. Ron Reagan, did you see that commercial? It was originally a couple of years old where he is doing a commercial for Freedom From Religion Foundation, which basically seeks to get religion out of all of society. And this is the way he ended the statement. I'm Ron Reagan. I'm a lifelong atheist and not afraid to go to hell. You can see it on YouTube, by the way. Go ahead. Look at YouTube. Ron Reagan, atheist. You'll see it. And not afraid to go to hell. Well, there's a reason for that, because he's never been there. And I don't think he knows a lot about it. And he's chosen to put his faith in the hypothesis that there is no God. And that's his right. But I wish we could interview him five seconds after death. How's it going for you, Ron? I will tell you that I'm not afraid of going to hell because I know Jesus is my Savior. He who hath the Son hath life. He who hath not the Son, the wrath of God abides on. If you want to choose atheism, by the way, I'm going to tell you something, that this life is all about faith. I'm not a mechanic. God knows that you can put what I know about the internal combustion engine in a thimble. But I know this. I know that you are putting an explosive in a contained area and you are igniting it with a spark. Now I know what happens if I, on the outside of that area, if I put a spark to gasoline. Vroom! I don't understand the internal workings of the internal combustion engine, but I have the faith that when I turn the key, it's going to move me forward and not upward. And I look at all of the evidence for God and I have chosen to believe that it is more logical to believe that there is a God than that everything I see in front of me today is just an accident. Because evolution tells you you are the product of time and accidents. Whole bunch of time whole bunch of mutations but it cannot account for the mind and the heart of human beings some chose empty religion and I must hurry on having a form of godliness but denying the power of it can I just say this so I can get on to the end of this and you're saying, hey, amen, say that and get to the end of this. There is a difference between religion and faith. 
man has made religion. God requires faith. Let's talk for just a moment about those who stayed. Verses 67 through 69. Jesus asked the question, will you also go away? Why did these stay when others left? The same reason many of you are here today while others have jumped ship. Number one, they understood the issue. Listen to what it says. Lord, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? Do you know that this was the second time in Scripture people left Jesus? Do you know what the other time was? It was when Mary and Joseph had gone up to Jerusalem to worship. And they're traveling in a company of people. And they leave and somehow they forgot Jesus. Now I, I got to tell you. There's been a couple of times I might have wanted to forget one of my kids. But I never forgot him. Do you know what's happened to us? If we're not careful, we become religious Christians and not Jesus Christians. And we get all caught up with the religion, but we leave Jesus behind. Here's why they didn't. Lord, they are saying, there's no place else to go. It's either Jesus or nothing. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but my man. Number two, they recognize the superiority of Jesus. You have the words of eternal life. Have you ever read the New Testament? Have you ever read the four Gospels? Have you ever, have you ever just taken apart the words that Jesus says? Have you ever really looked at him? Do you understand what his personality is like? Do you understand why the children love to be with him, but the snotty religionists hated to be around him? Because he was real. Because he was absolutely real. He was the same with the king that he was with a beggar. And he loved both. There was a leper who came to Jesus and said, Lord, if you would, you could make me clean. And Jesus touched him. Do you know what the big deal was? Nobody touched lepers in those days. But Jesus touched him. And he said, I will. Be thou clean. Have you really learned who Jesus is? You never will until you get into the New Testament. Until you get into the Gospels. Look at his words. Watch his reactions. See how he deals with people. Peter said, who can we go to? There isn't anyone else. And in that moment in time, Peter nailed the issue. Number three, they trusted Jesus as Savior. Verse 69, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. We know who you are. We have watched what you have done. We have listened to what you have said. We saw you turn water into wine. We saw you make a blind man see. We have heard the words that you have spoken like no one ever spoke before. We were there when you called Lazarus back to life. And we are sure that you are the Son of God. And my question to you today is, is your faith in Jesus Christ that sure? If it is, shouldn't it be a faith that you want to share? We believe and are sure that you are the Christ the Son of the living God. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, the Apostle Paul says this, and I close with this, I know who I have believed. Paul, are you sure? Are you sure that Jesus is Messiah? I know who I believed. 
Now, can I just stop for a second to remind you that Paul is an eyewitness to the ministry of Jesus Christ. He's not one of these critics who lived 2,000 years later. I know who I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed unto him against the day of God's judgment. Can you say that today? Do you know he is your savior? Do you know and are sure that he is the son of God and you have taken him as the bread of life and you will never be spiritually hungry again? Would you bow your heads please? with heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around. And even to our internet audience this morning, if you're listening to me and you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, if you're not sure that Jesus is your savior, I wanna take you through the plan of salvation here for just a moment. Listen to me in the audience and also on the internet. Listen to me, A, admit that you are a sinner. You will never know Jesus as Savior until you see your need, until you realize that you cannot save yourself. Admit that you're a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. B, believe in Jesus as the risen Son of God. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, call upon him. Ask him to be your savior. If you've never accepted Jesus as your savior on the internet, here in the audience, would you pray this prayer with me? If you want to know that Jesus is your savior, if you want to know that you are born again, then simply pray this prayer from your heart. Lord, Forgive my sin. I trust Jesus as my Savior. I believe He loved me. I believe He died for me. And I believe He rose again. Come into my heart. Forgive my sin. And save me and if you will do that then God will do the rest thank you father for our time together this morning thank you for your love and your grace thank you for our folks who have come out to worship here today and for our folks who have joined us on the internet and now may you dismiss us in your love we pray in the precious name of Jesus amen Again, for our internet audience, thank you for being with us today. I'm going to say goodbye to you. We pray that you would have a good week and walk with Jesus.